Right. Welcome to this introduction to WASC. Uh, my name is Kevin Hoffman. Uh, a little about me before I get started. Uh, I have been using WebAssembly for a couple of years now. I'm the creator of the WASC open source project. I'm the author of the book Programming WebAssembly with Rust. So the agenda for this video is uh, first thing I want to do is take a look at some of the problems with software development today and how WebAssembly in general uh, or as a technology and technology standard might be able to help us. And then I will introduce WASC and go over some WASC key concepts and how WASC uh, aims to improve on our software development experience today. And then finally, we'll get to the good stuff, which is the demos. So software development today is uh, full of copy and pasted complexity. And this is where we have a solution to one problem, another problem comes along, and we often tend to just copy and paste the solution from one problem to another. And like any good sci-fi movie about clones, when you clone a clone, you lose fidelity. And we lose that same type of fidelity when we uh, continually reuse solutions, reuse solutions to problems. We get further and further away from the problem that we were originally trying to solve. And uh, the amount of boilerplate that our code is filled with is partly to blame here. Because it's such a chore to rewrite all of this, all of the ceremony that our code normally needs, we copy and paste it. And so we copy and paste the boilerplate and business logic because the boilerplate is usually um, difficult to separate from the business logic. And the development that we do these days is often high friction, especially when it comes to the operations experience. And I'll get more into that later. And so I think the bottom line is that while there are certainly exceptions, one of the things that typifies today's development is that 90% of the time that we devote to software development is spent on satisfying non-functional requirements, whereas we only spend 10% of our time working on actual features. And hopefully what we want to do is invert that ratio. But today we generally have unhappy developers and unhappy developers burn out fast and we don't build the kinds of quality products that we want to build. So software development today to summarize is not portable enough, it's not secure enough by default, it's not easy enough to deploy, and it's not easy enough to update and maintain. And you know while we have we have technology like Docker and Kubernetes. In many cases, those things actually add to the complexity and to the friction and the difficulty that developers have in building and deploying and maintaining their applications and services. So how can WebAssembly help us with this problem? First of all, WebAssembly is portable. Uh, WebAssembly's instruction format uh, in, in its virtual machine is both CPU and operating system agnostic. That means with the same WebAssembly module uh, will operate the same no matter where it's run so long as it has a suitable host runtime. WebAssembly is fast. It's a stack-based virtual machine uh, and so its instruction execution is extremely fast, and uh, as I'll explain in a little bit later in the video, uh, we also have the ability to uh, compile ahead our WebAssembly instructions into uh, native machine instructions. WebAssembly is secure. Uh, by definition, the WebAssembly virtual machine is a sandbox, and that sandbox has memory isolation, the instruction set for WebAssembly does not allow for executing instructions outside that module. And so by default, this development target is more secure than uh, most of what we're doing these days. 
the WebAssembly modules are lightweight. Um, you know, and there are exceptions to all the rules, but most of the time when we're building WebAssembly modules, especially when we build uh, actors like I'll, I'll show later in this video, they're extremely small. And finally, I think one of the most important points here is that we can embrace the limitations and the, the hard boundaries around uh, the WebAssembly machine format and turn those into advantages that we can leverage for improving our own development experience. So what is WASC? WASC is designed to improve the developer, the developer experience while creating a safer, safer and simpler operations model. First, it stands for WebAssembly Secure Capabilities Connector. And uh, as its name implies, the WASC host runtime is designed to securely connect uh, capability providers with uh, actors that consume those capabilities. You compose business features by writing actors, and I'll get more into what an actor is in a minute. We securely bind those actors to capabilities, and we can run actors and capabilities anywhere. Uh, this is specifically to leverage the portability and the uh, size and speed of WebAssembly. The other thing is WASC is cryptogra cryptographically secure. And I'll show this in one of the demos, but we can verify the creator of any WebAssembly module, and, and we can verify the chain of provenance. So uh, a, an actor built for the WASC ecosystem, we know uh, which entity signed that actor, and we know which entity uh, signed for that entity. And so we can trace the provenance as far back as we want. And we also have an exact list of what that actor is allowed to do. If that actor is allowed to use an HTTP server but not talk to a database, that's exactly what the host runtime will enforce. So let's take a look at the WASP stack, because like any good open source project, it is built on the shoulders of other giants in the open source area. So at the bottom, the core of the WASP stack is the WebAssembly engine. And WebAssembly engines tend to come in two different varieties. We have the jitter, or the, the compilers, or the interpreters. And the compilers, uh, as their name implies, take the WebAssembly instructions and compile them into native machine instructions for whichever machine read that WebAssembly module at runtime. Interpreters, on the other hand, uh, don't convert the WebAssembly instructions. They just interpret them uh, as they encounter them. And uh, there are use cases where you you might want a jitter and use cases where you might want an interpreter. Interpreters are uh, going to have less startup time uh, as a penalty, uh, but they might have a higher latency on individual function calls, although the interpreters that we have access to today are still extremely fast. Above this in the stack is WebAssembly procedure calls. And uh, this is a, is a standard that was created to allow, uh, to allow code to invoke functions inside a WebAssembly module that would allow the sending and receiving of arbitrary binary payloads. And one of the things, one of the limitations that the WebAssembly standard has is that it can only support numeric parameters to functions. And so we needed some way to allow us to, in combination with access to the WebAssembly module's memory, send and receive arbitrary payloads. And another uh, detail uh, about WAPC is that it allows for the sending and receiving of these payloads 
in a way that is blissfully unaware of the allocation patterns of any of the host or guest languages. And so what that means is a lot of times when we when we see WebAssembly modules that are generated through code generation and JavaScript uh, shims and things like that, we'll see that those modules rely on a JavaScript-style uh, memory allocation pattern uh, for the host runtime. And so that limits that module's portability. Uh, WAPC is designed specifically to avoid that situation. So as long so a language, whether it's a guest or a host, can conform to WAPC regardless of how memory is allocated in that language and regardless of whether that language even has a garbage collector. WAPC also serves as an anti-corruption layer between the WebAssembly engine and the higher levels. So you should be able to swap out the WebAssembly engine um, for purpose-built stacks depending on your use case without having to rewrite any of the code that exists above the WAPC level. So above WAPC, we have a, a Rust crate called WASCAP, uh, and this crate provides capabilities-based security, as I've mentioned. Uh, this is where all of the code exists that uh, embeds cryptographically signed JSON web tokens into WebAssembly modules reads them from the modules and performs uh, all of the different verification checks that you need to perform on those tokens. Above that is another crate called WASC host. And this is the core library that, that's used uh, as the host runtime for actors and capabilities in the WASC uh, ecosystem. And then finally, we have a, a generic WASC host binary. So, if your needs aren't all that specific and what you're doing uh, is just uh, dynamically hosting actors and capabilities, then you should be able to use this host binary uh, as, your, as the process that you schedule in, on whatever infrastructure you're using. But it's also fairly easy to create your own custom binaries that uh, allow you to mix and match the set of features that are specific to your needs. So let's take a look at how microservice development looks today. Um, first of all, it's tightly coupled, and it's a tightly coupled experience, and microservices, by and large, are not composable. As I said, there's exception to every rule, but in general, this is what a typical microservice looks like. We have a small amount of business logic, but then we have the components that we're all familiar with, the components that often end up as part of that copy and pasted boilerplate that we move from one project to the next. And that's our HTTP server, our routing rules, all of our RESTful service baggage, our HTTP clients, our logging, our analytics. If we want to improve performance with caching, uh, access to a relational database, all of those things add brittleness and tight coupling to our microservices and they prevent us from allowing our services to be neatly composable. And more importantly, when we have lots and lots and lots of these services, we have essentially duplicates of all of these items in yellow here, uh, all of these non-functional requirements. There's no sharing involved. But what if we were to take a look at how we might build services with actors? Uh, in with actors, we have loose coupling and actors are fully composable. So our actor code, the core of what we write is, or should be 90% uh, feature. It should be pure business logic. And then when we want to use an HTTP client, our code consumes a generic abstraction over HTTP clients. And the WASC host runtime is responsible for dynamically satisfying the requirements of an HTTP client to our actor. Our code is unaware of which HTTP client we're using or how that HTTP client got configured. The WASC host runtime takes care of all of that for us. The same goes with the HTTP server. 
our relational database client, and our cache clients, and any other capability we can dream up. Our actors are isolated, highly testable, small units of, of deployment. So what does the development workflow look like when we're building actors in WASC? The first thing we do is we create an actor. And today we can create that actor in Rust or assembly script or Zig. Um, hopefully soon we'll be able to create one in Go once uh, Go's WebAssembly integration gets a little bit better. We'll compile that actor to a, a, a .wasm file. And this is our and this is our portable unit of deployment. We'll sign the actor with capability claims, and those claims get embedded directly into the WASM file. And this is a different model than how we secure some of our Docker-based environments today, where the claims and the permissions and the list of what can and cannot be done is stored separately, and it's very easy to accidentally separate the policies from the, the targets of those policies. A simple typo can allow an entire suite of vulnerabilities to magically appear. And then we will host our actor in the WASP runtime. At runtime, the, the actors are bound to capability providers with configuration. And now we'll take a look at what an actor looks like. This is using the Rust SDK, and in just a, a small amount of code, you should be able to tell, even if you can't really read Rust, that what we're doing is handling two different messages. We're handling a health request, and we're handling an HTTP request. And a pattern that is pretty common uh, as part of the actor model in general is the idea of being reactive. These actors can't do anything on their own. They cannot initiate their own actions. They can only react to things. And so uh, these actors, the actor that I've got on the screen here, is reacting to an HTTP request. And in response to that request, it will increment a value stored in a key value store and then return the new value of that in a JSON payload. And What's important about this code sample is what's not in here. There's no code to uh, create, configure, or instantiate an HTTP endpoint. There's no code to configure RESTful capabilities. There's no code to create and configure a key value store endpoint. That code, uh, there's, no, there's nothing tightly coupled to it. So what you can't tell from this code is how the HTTP server is satisfied and how the key value store is satisfied. This code has nothing in it that would tell you that you're using uh, DynamoDB or Redis or uh, um, console or any other form of key value store. And when the response is returned, it's a data structure that describes an HTTP response. How that response is physically delivered to a consumer is not your concern as an actor developer. This, is, this should be pure business logic and pure feature fulfillment. And all of the non-functional requirements are part of the WASP runtime. Capability providers are very similar in that they're also reactive and they respond to messages. And so in this case, what we have is a capability provider for a key value store, and we see the list of operations, the list of messages that it can respond to. And so creating a capability provider is also uh, fairly straightforward and fairly easy to do. So let's take a look at our first demo. And in this demo, we're going to create our first actor. To create a new actor, we could do a couple of different things. We could do it from scratch, or we can use a, a new template. And for the Rust SDK, actually, we have a template for creating a new actor. I've created a new project called Hello, and I will go into that project directory, and let's take a look at what we got. So uh, we get a cargo.toml file, a make file, 
and some source code. And let's just take a look at the source first. And uh, the vast majority of the source is comments. Uh, but if you look, look at what we get out of the box, it's an actor that's handling two different messages. It's handling the health request, and it's handling an HTTP request. And the response to the HTTP request is an OK with no body. And as I've uh, discussed in presentations, what you don't see here is the code to start an HTTP server. You don't see code that uh, assigns a port number, and there's no routing rules. It's just pure business logic where you, as the actor developer, get to declare what it is your code is going to do in response to an HTTP request. And so what we need to do before we can run this is to uh, compile it. And uh, the video editing process and that build took much less time than usual. And what I now have is a WebAssembly module that I've built. And before I can run this WebAssembly module in the West Coast runtime, I need to embed a JSON web token in it so that I can uh, assign it and attest to the capabilities that I want it to have. And if we look at the make file, we'll see that we have uh, some of that stuff already taken care of for us. So if you look at the build and release tasks, you'll see that I'm using the WASCAP CLI to sign the hello.wasm file using a account.nk file for the issuer key and the module.nk file for the subject key. And so the make file also comes with the ability to create keys. So first thing we see is the list of actors that we're going to run inside this West Coast. Uh, it's probably an important detail to remember that WASC hosts are capable of hosting many, many actors and capabilities all in the same process. Uh, it's another one of the goals of the project is to achieve a greater uh, workload density when we're deploying these things to the cloud. And so I've got the actor here. I have the capability that I want to load, which is a uh, Linux uh, dynamically linked library that I'm using as a plugin. And then I have the bindings for my actor. And this is the public key of the actor, and I'm binding it to the WASP HTTP server capability with the configuration inside this values tag, and I'm signing the port to 8081. Now, what's interesting here is that this actor is not the same as the actor that I signed, and that's because I just generated a new set of private keys. And every time I change a private key, it will change the public identity of a module. And so when you are going through the WASC samples and through the GitHub repository and uh, tutorials, you'll notice that there are a number of times where it mentions that the, the actor's public key will not match what you have on your system. And that's because the private keys that we have on our system or in GitHub or in our CI pipeline are not going to be the private keys you have on your machine. So what I need to do is change this actor in this module. So first thing I'm going to do is copy the module that I got from uh, examining the capabilities. And then I'm going to modify this manifest real quick. I'll replace that. Make sure that took. So now I have a new module a new uh, module key in this manifest. So let's try that again. And now I realize this isn't as interesting as a web UI or a video game, but uh, there are some interesting things happening here. The first thing we can see is that the West Coast discovered capability attestations for an actor. 
and it says that, it's working, that it uses the WASC HTTP server. You can see that it's loading uh, our HTTP server, uh, which is provided by a Rust trait called Actix. And this is the uh, capability provider and the binding. And I'll discuss bindings in another detailed session later. So this is up and running, and so I should be able to open another terminal here and curl the service running on port 8081. And uh, as I discussed earlier, what was happening was we were just returning OK with no body. So this is exactly what I would expect to get. And just to verify that that's, that's why I got that answer, let's stop the West Coast and try and curl that again. And now I get connection refused. So what we're really looking at here is this tiny little bit of code is now able to respond to HTTP requests, but more importantly, it's able to consume capabilities over abstractions in a loosely coupled fashion where the connection to that capability is cryptographically secure and can be swapped out at runtime. The actor can be swapped out at runtime. And because the WebAssembly module is portable, our code can go anywhere from a Raspberry Pi to the cloud to an edge service, all without ever having to be recompiled. And that's the demo for creating a new actor in WASC.
our second demo will be adding additional capabilities to the action we created in the first demo. And finally, we're going to do a demo showing some of the more advanced features of the West Coast runtime where we will allow actors to participate in a uh, distributed network called the Lattice.